Hi everybody, I'm Tracy Donegan. Uh, thank you so much for joining me today. It's, I know we're kind of getting to the end of this amazing 24 hours. I'm uh, very excited to kind of get logged back in and, and look at everyone else's presentations because I have to say this organization does an incredible job year over year and the, the quality of the presentations gets better and better and it's amazing to see what's really happening out in the birth world, around the world with, uh, with other midwives and, and birth professionals. So. I thought I would, I guess, throw throw a little spanner in the works out there because I really think it's time that we rethink breastfeeding preparation. Um, I came across a study there a couple of days ago and it mentioned that 85% of postpartum women are going to experience some kind of mood disorder uh, during postpartum, like 85% of mothers. So just keep that number kind of in the back of your mind. And, and, I, and I'm sure you are probably as frustrated as I am. And uh, if there's any doulas on the group and, and just how women are being, I guess how breastfeeding is being presented to women in classes and what we can do to make sure that women are getting really good information and are getting good evidence-based information when it comes to breastfeeding. So I do think it's time to rethink breastfeeding preparation, but I'll I'll present my argument to you today and you can decide if, uh, if you're in agreement or not, or if there's ways that we can connect together and figure out what is going on. Um, this is a, it's a very famous quote, insanity is repeating the same mistakes and expecting different results. So scientific knowledge on of ways to make breastfeeding more comfortable, um, to encourage women to breastfeed for longer uh, and, and to make it more fulfilling. It has, the, the science has evolved, but yet we're still teaching complicated holds. Um, we are so far from physiologic breastfeeding, it's, it's beyond a joke. So we need to look at what is the evidence for what I consider to be a mindful breastfeeding program, as in bringing um, more skills to parents so that it's not just about the mechanics of breastfeeding, but the actual impact of the mental impact of postpartum and that absolutely huge um, transition. But I want to know why hasn't the has, hasn't practice evolved with the science? And I think you know we all know the answer to that. It's the same when it comes to you know pregnancy and birth that we're still looking at outdated, non evidence based um, care for, an, unfortunately, a huge amount of uh, women in the world today. So just a disclosure that I do have a mindful breastfeeding program, and I do uh, receive income from the sale of my books and programs. So again, nothing new here. We've like ridiculously low levels of rates in uh, breastfeeding rates over six months when it comes to the US. The UK rates are it's and, and tragic really. One percent of UK infants exclusively breastfed to six months. So it is definitely time when we look at you know the Lancet series a couple of weeks ago and the you know women are challenged not just with their own thoughts and feelings about breastfeeding their own challenges but society as a whole and marketing uh, to to these women so you know as midwives and birth professionals we talk about the naturalness of breastfeeding and yet if you looked at a breastfeeding book lately <laughs> and when you pick up any of the traditionally uh, recommended books like we're sending women off with a stack of books this height and in the same sentence we're telling women that breastfeeding is natural so we can't have it both ways so women are getting mixed messages right from the beginning that yes it's natural yes it's the best for your baby and for you is it instinctive is it spontaneous is it easy because that's what the words we would associate when it comes to natural. It depends on whose opinion you get. If you get the baby's opinion and they've had a healthy, straightforward physiological birth, is it instinctive, spontaneous, easy? Pretty much if we can set the table really for baby. Um, for mom, is it instinctive, spontaneous, easy? It can be easier if we can look at how we are again teaching women about breastfeeding what we're doing in those initial moments after birth and what parents can do moving forward into that postpartum period so this idea that breastfeeding is natural 
we we just can't do that and then give them books that are 500 pages long you know i think um some of the breastfeeding books are a little bit thicker than some of my midwifery texts were when i was uh back in the day but i wanted to i guess explore more about everyone i'm sure i that is joining me today and will watch this presentation at a future time understands under undisturbed birth we know that there is a specific set of circumstances that we can facilitate as midwives to facilitate an undisturbed birth but what is happening then we have an undisturbed birth where we can we are stepping back we are you know drinking tea intelligently observing and if mom is coping great we're just there to to smile and reassure her and it should be the same when it comes to breastfeeding after birth so especially again we're coming to mom having a physiologic straightforward non-eventful birth that why is it that breastfeeding that we just can't follow this the same kind of rules when it comes to uh undisturbed birth we're very quick to get our hands in there and get that baby and breast together um so i'm encouraging midwives especially if you're used to being more hands-on that you take a look at you know what are the elements of undisturbed breastfeeding how can we create that for women in our care so postpartum is considered a predictable crisis so as midwives and birth professionals we have a professional and a moral responsibility to provide effective safe options to help parents meet those challenges of postpartum with self-compassion and acceptance relaxation techniques just are not enough if we go back to that first number that I mentioned, 85% of women experiencing some kind of mood disturbance in postpartum. And, and if we consider this predictable crisis, we know this crisis is coming in this, this mother's life and, this, and their partner's life, but specifically for the mother. And we look at the leading direct cause of maternal death in some countries is suicide. So how do we help women and their partners prepare for the emotional turmoil that comes with postpartum and that often comes with breastfeeding are we telling them to relax are we telling them you know take a breath or think positive there is no other circumstance where we know a crisis is coming where we would be we would think it was any way appropriate to not give these parents these life skills we're sending them away with relaxation techniques for one of the biggest crises really of their adult lives so when we look at what's going on in the brain when it comes to you know why why would mindfulness and breastfeeding even like go together because most people think it's a it's a relaxation um it's a relaxation technique so in pregnancy we have a time of these accelerated neuroplasticity there is lots happening with the brain as it changes to get ready for that role of motherhood to bond with this baby um and to love on your baby so we have our brain is being influenced by external sources and internal sources but for a lot of women especially in those initial few days of postpartum you've just come out of labor or you've just had you know had a cesarean you're exhausted your body doesn't feel like it's working your brain isn't working you're in this exhausted fog and so all of this is changing the brain internal environment external environment but mindfulness has also been shown to create structural changes in the brain and particularly in areas that are associated with positive mood and we can reduce activity we are all familiar with that fight or flight response we can reduce activity in that stress response just by naming what's happening by interrupting the pattern of thought we also know that the baby's brain is influenced by the environment and that initial environment for those nine months is mom's body so we want baby marinating in those lovely oxytocin hormones and not in a, a chronically stressed environment because what that's teaching the brain is are we preparing the brain for life outside of the womb to be one of thriving or is the brain being prepared for survival and that will impact the structural the structure of, of our, our baby's brains as well so then this is not about beating our, ourselves up because you know we had a stressful day in work when we're pregnant 
it's about starting to notice our stress responses and react in a different way, really to change our relationship with stressful thoughts. So mindfulness is the awareness that arises through paying attention on purpose in the present moment, non-judgmentally. So, and it's really, we start off with the awareness. So awareness is we start to notice those dodgy uh, patterns of thought that we might have. And I'm going to give you a prime example in a minute that will, uh, that will just, I guess, show this really, really clearly. So it's, first of all, it's noticing that I'm aware that I'm having the thought that my baby is really hungry all the time um, of paying attention on purpose to the present moment. So the, the mind is such a great time traveler, spends a huge amount of time that we consider to be at 50 percent of the time time traveling. So it's either in the past replaying an event or it's gone time traveling into the future to create uh, anxiety around something that has not happened yet. But when we look at the components of mindful meditation, again, you can see where this idea that it's a relaxation technique completely diverges. A relaxation technique is really about reducing physiological stress in that moment and getting the body back to a state of homeostasis. Mindfulness meditation, there's specific components and mechanisms that impact what's going on in the mind, or impact what's going on in the body. So attention regulation is a big part of that. So it's intentionally directing our attention to the present moment. So when you find yourself going off to Tesco's to do the, the, the and going through your shopping list when you're supposed to be doing something else, or it's starting to be aware, yeah, the mind is a constant time traveler. That's what it does. But oftentimes our mind, you know, gets on a train of thought to stress town. But when we have the awareness of, oh, you know what? There goes my mind off to you know, stress town again. I have an opportunity to shorten that stress response because I have an awareness of it's the thought that's creating the stress in me and not an, ex an external event. And um, then we have body awareness. So you're starting to tune into your body. And, and as again, most of us live from the neck up. So body awareness becomes a big part of a mindful meditation and noticing your how your body is connecting with the chair or the ground, noticing what's happening within the body. Because oftentimes we can, we can, I guess, recognize an emotion in our body before it even reaches the brain and the brain decides, oh, that's anxiety or no, that's excitement because the both of them are, are quite uh, similar physiologically. And then there's emotional regulation. And this is really, I think, where, where they, the meat is when it comes to a mindfulness practice starting in pregnancy. You start to learn just to notice your thoughts without judging them. We already have enough sticks to beat ourselves up with and not attaching to them. So oftentimes what we do is we, we want all the good things. We don't want bad things to happen. And either we push them away or we ignore them or we find a way to distract ourselves. And also changes in the perspective of the self. So I, I often think of when we look at what's happening in those initial moments when uh, this baby has been born and the physiological process of, I mean, when you, it's just incredible when, you, when you're learning about how, you know, the areola changes temperature, you know, for, for you know, the baby coming to find the breast and find the nipple and uh, the, the smell of the amniotic fluid and all of this that's, that's, you know, teaching baby where to find their food source. And it's so we, there's so much we don't even know about this process. And to be able to, I think of it as like the Sistine Chapel. If you were to, and if you've ever had the opportunity to see it in person, um, it's when you look at this incredible piece of art, and it ties in nicely with you know the art and science of midwifery. When we look at this art, this piece of art is around around physiological breastfeeding. But I feel like what we're currently doing, it's it's not the Sistine Chapel. It's like toddler finger painting. When we get our hands in there and start trying to manipulate the baby and manipulate uh, mom, especially as you know, we're seeing in more research now that moms do not want to have their breasts manipulated or their breasts, what they're called, um, manhandled. Um, so why does this matter? Why does it matter that we start helping women just notice their thoughts and, and those th thought patterns that can create so much misery? And it matters because you never hear new mothers saying, I can't stop thinking all these happy thoughts. I just feel blissful all the time. 
postpartum is a breeze. We never hear that. We rarely hear that. Um, we usually hear the opposite. So there's these default settings of the brain that that makes pregnancy more difficult, makes uh, breastfeeding more difficult. One of them is the negativity bias. So it's like the factory settings of the brain or the factory settings on your phone. So it is the brain is always biased towards looking for um, safety and avoiding danger. So it's always on the lookout for threats. So it's much easier for the brain to focus on the bad stuff than it is on the good stuff. So, you know, 100,000 years ago, we were living in caves and you went out hunting for your, your dinner and you heard a rustling in the bushes. The mind would almost automatically think it's a tiger. It's not going to think hamster because we'd better off thinking it's something bad. And then we live to, you know, to survive another day because the brain did not evolve for being all zen and and it's the brain evolved ultimately for survival to get our genes into the next generation um, and then mind wandering we've already talked about that with the mind wanders about 50 percent of the time even as you're sitting here listening to me today you've got there's other um distractions that are competing for your attention so just being aware of these two kind of factory settings that we all have and how they can impact our pregnancy, birth and breastfeeding. Negativity bias, we're always on the lookout for trouble. So it's much easier for the brain to remember problematic events, um, difficult events, and then it does to remember something positive. So I encourage uh, women in pregnancy to do what I call uh, birth basking, as in sitting uh, imagining you you're you've just had your baby and all of those feelings that go around and you're actually rehearsing positive feelings you're rehearsing that feeling of accomplishment and achievement and, and absolute wonder because your baby is now in your arms because if we don't train the brain in that way the brain is automatically going to go to worst case scenario and unfortunately in the medicalized world that we live in now and the high levels of intervention this is women are expecting for things not to go really well so it is a state of heart and mind again not a relaxation technique it's a benefit it is a, kind of like a side effect that we experience when we understand the mind and how it works against us um especially when we're on autopilot and that's what we would consider like mind mindlessness so we usually say don't believe everything you think especially as a new mom um we and, and and not just as a new mom, I think it's it's a it's a good life lesson for for all of us because we tend to identify with our thoughts so much. It kind of causes uh, more issues. And you know, people have said to me, you know, mindfulness it's kind of like a uh, meditation. It's this you know navel gazing, you know, chanting, and it's like a bubble bath for your brain. It's so much more than this. And if we could even just getting moms just uh, just looking at this of not believing everything you think that thoughts are not facts, we would be off to a really good start with breastfeeding. So if we look at th this scenario here is happening every single day in, I'm in, pretty sure in most countries, it's the same mom, same baby, but a different response. So if the mom on the left has the thought, my baby always seems hungry. And we know this is one of the top reasons why women will stop breastfeeding. It is that perception that they don't have enough milk and the baby is crying and seems to be hungry. So if the initial thought is my baby always seems to be hungry, and then it has a, you know, each negative thought kind of tacks on underneath that and it becomes this downward spiral. So is he getting enough milk? Maybe my milk isn't giving him what he needs. What if I am starving him? So you can see how it just gets more and more negative to the very end of I'm not enough and I'm a terrible mom from that. And that came just, she has now, this mother has completely questioned her identity, her, her worth as a woman, as a mother, based on one thought, my baby's all, my baby always seems hungry. So you can see on the left-hand side, that is kind of the, it's a very common scenario for women today. Um, if we go to the right hand side, and this is a mom who has some experience in mindfulness and has is now starting to you know practice some of some of these uh, approaches during pregnancy and now into uh, postpartum. My baby always seems hungry, so it's the very same thought. But instead of allowing that spiral downward, what we have is mom 
noticing, oh, I'm noticing I'm having the thought that my baby is always hungry. So by doing that, we are creating a little bit of, of uh, distance between ourselves and the thought. Because when we identify with the thought, it feels like that that is us. It, it, that's me. I'm my baby's always hungry. I'm not doing something for my baby. And it's interesting in when it comes to language in like in like in English, English speaking countries, we would say uh, I am sad or I am anxious or whatever that that feeling is. In Irish, we would say ta bronorum, which means literally translated means there is sadness on me. But we don't identify with it. I'm not, it's when we say in English, I'm sad or I'm depressed, it becomes part of our personality. Whereas when we can create a little bit of distance between the thought and the emotions that are coming after it, it can change that woman's whole experience. So then she will ask, is this thought helpful? And this is a, this is a, a nice little you know, kind of, you know, hack to use during pregnancy as well. Is this thought helpful? Well, we don't know, maybe it is, but that gives us, again, it lets us interrupt the pattern, is a thought helpful? And it gives us a chance to bring on that executive functioning part of the brain to, oh yeah, well, well, I did learn that if they're having lots of wet and dirty diapers and they're gaining weight and, and you, know, you know, relaxing between feeds, then it sounds like things are actually okay. But I don't have any proof uh, but that there is a problem, but I'm going to get some more support. So we have two very different women's experiences based on whether they knew to, oh, yeah, like that, that is what I, I call it, uh, not taking the bait. So that's a thought that how is the thought making me feel in my body? So it's making me feel anxious, then maybe that's not a train of thought we want to stay on. But if you're thinking all the lovely things about your baby, and how great breastfeeding is going and how much you're enjoying it, that's a thought we want to keep trending. But again, positivity is not big on the brain's priorities. So it will always try to go to, yeah, but what if? And what if this happens? And yeah. Let's just focus on present moment. So I hope that this slide, I think, will be helpful to help understand how mindfulness can really shortcut a stressful interaction um, between mom and her own mind. Um, because we know that psychological distress will impact a mother's feeding decisions. So it's, uh, but we're not doing that right now. We're not helping them. So yeah, is this thought helpful? So we want to start small. We don't want to be practicing on, on, you know, big stressful events. Starting in pregnancy, you get to practice with the, the little small stuff, irritations, um, because experiential learning is just as important as knowledge transfer. So what we're getting in the books is one thing, but being able to actually um, regulate your own emotions. I mean, this is something we should be teaching yeah, school age kids. We, yes, we want them learning math, we want them learning English and being able to be, you know, productive citizens. But if we're not teaching, you know, young adults and children how to regulate their emotional state, they're going to be faced with, you know, all kinds of challenges in their lives. And we've left them again with no tools. So never mind postpartum, we don't even have even given our, you know, our kids the tools to, uh, to actually, you know, manage life as it is. So a mindful approach is not telling mothers to go sit on a cushion and meditate when they're experiencing a mental or emotional crisis. What we see is when, uh, when women are practicing mindfulness is they have a clarity of thought because when we turn off that, that limbic brain, that stress response, we can that executive functioning of the brain comes back online so we can actually recall what we learned in the class, assuming it was an evidence-based class, um, and we can use that information ourselves then for making informed decisions, making decisions from a place of calm and not a place of chaos, which is unfortunately where so many mothers find themselves. We have so many women that are stopping breastfeeding before they were ready to and are left with feelings of guilt and um, anxiety and grief for some of these women as well. And we've ha we have these different cohorts. We have the women who are struggling with breastfeeding and with the, you know, their own thoughts that they're having about breastfeeding that can derail their journey. And then we have another group of women then who, again, are um, doing better during, during breastfeeding, but they can all still use these tools and whether things are going really well or not really well. And there is some really interesting 
research on using mindfulness skills for uh, parents of babies who are in NICU, because again, they are experiencing, you know, in a, a, a extreme level of stress and for themselves to be able to emotionally regulate their own mental states and uh, protect their own um, mental health. I think this was actually a double one. So it's more than mechanics. And what I um, you know what, what I've developed is it's a mind body approach to breastfeeding preparation. And what I've done is combining mindfulness with uh nancy moorbacker's amazing uh, mindful or natural breastfeeding program so what we're trying to do is we start with the mind and we're focusing on mindfulness and compassion practices compassion practices are again these are things that uh, the mom can do standing in a supermarket when her baby is not having a good moment that you don't have to find a cushion and sit and meditate simple and um, body focused uh, practices that will will turn on the oxytocin activity in the brain and that that network and sh and start to calm down the uh, the anxiety level so then we have a body approach so we're talking about the physiologic approach nancy talks about um the starter positions so we are having women lay back and i call it the netflix position because it's like that totally relaxed tv position we have babies that are placed on the breast we don't have to make them crawl 20 miles to get to the breast this i know we, we've, we've almost become obsessed with the doing the breast crawl but we can the baby has just come through a marathon as well it's like you run a marathon and then you get to the finish line and someone says yeah you just have to go another mile down the street to pick up your medal so let's not make babies work any harder than they need to so having baby on the breast but ventral position as in focus forward leaning forward full body contact on mom some of the most common reasons for early cessation of breastfeeding pain anxiety and stress that emotional turmoil turmoil perceived low supply family work life low breastfeeding self-efficacy and birth interventions and understanding and working with the mind can impact all of these areas in a positive way so mindfulness is not just for someone that you think might need some extra help because she's a little bit anxious it is for everybody and um, there was a study a couple of years ago looking at um hospitalized high-risk women who were show and when they were they were high-risk women they were in hospital for significant periods of time during their pregnancy and they were they looked at you know their anxiety rates and depression rates and they found that just by giving them a, a digital mindfulness program for one week was enough to significantly reduce their stress levels and reduce their anxiety levels. So this is not, we don't, they don't have to go live on a mountaintop or do you know, a silent retreat for 10 days. These are really simple practices that we can help implement. And even if it's just that one thing of starting to have women more aware of those patterns of thoughts that they have. Um, these are just a couple of, um from some qualitative studies i've cited them at the very end about women's experiences of using meditation so this first one this is a mom with their baby in nicu which is i would say for me meditating really helps me when i'm in a place where i'm extremely anxious over something i can't control so meditation has been hugely helpful here because i think the nature of this place is that there's often nothing the parents can do other than what the nurses say hold them when you when you can talk to them softly that kind of thing so yeah i think meditation is hugely helpful so there's also some really interesting research around mindfulness and postpartum body image and making friends with our body and, and being compassionate towards our body after birth and our our new body that we uh that we experience um, changes our relationship with our partner. We know the first year with a new baby is tough going, it can be tough going on relationships. And instead of you know, you know, counting the number of times that you've gotten up at night and scores, and we can start to relate to our partners in a little different way, um, and that they're not there to irritate us because we are, you know, we're, we're we can be quite irritable in those uh, first couple of you know months when nobody's really getting much sleep. And then reducing birth trauma it's there's been some studies on looking at ways to i guess inoculate against trauma as such and ptsd so 
Um, unfortunately, or fortunately, um, a lot of this research has been done on the US Army. So but they were finding that by teaching, again, simple mindfulness skills that they found that meditation could be a buffer against trauma. So again, it's about not believing everything we think and being able to, to have resource to settle ourselves in our body um, during postpartum and reducing overwhelm. If you think of how exhausted we are in postpartum, and I really feel like when we look at postpartum depletion, part of the issue is the fact that we are, have so much conflicting thoughts that are going through our, our head in those first couple of months, debating breastfeeding, not breastfeeding, uh, pair other moms judging us, you know, what our body looks like, you know, our new identity. There is just so much happening. So to be able to kind of create a space, and it's not a space where we're not thinking, we're not, it's not about stopping thought, it's about noticing the thoughts that make me feel good, and it's noticing the thoughts that make me feel really bad, and the ones that really are affecting me in a negative way, that I spend less time on that train of thought. So th there's nothing mystical about what we're teaching, we're just, it's really about awareness of that, uh, of thoughts. So prepare the, some of the mindful the benefits uh, reducing anxiety that self judgment our self talk I think you know everyone on the planet could do with a dose of mindfulness I think especially in today's um, world with so much you know mental health stress after COVID um, but what we do see you know in the research is it changes pain perception again we know nipple pain is a big part of why women stop breastfeeding but what are we going to do for those women who we have this co cohort of women who are breastfeeding and um, what about the women who stop breastfeeding who stop before they really wanted to there is nothing for those women we have left a whole group of women with no support what are they supposed to do with these feelings of grief or inadequacy or failure um, and I think that for me is a, is a huge part of, of the benefits of this mindful awareness um, because we know, again, in, in the research, it's really clear around body shame as well. And, and for women, for whatever reason that they stopped, there's usually something around the body that I couldn't do it or pain um, that we can help women start to notice. Is this, you know, is this thought helpful? Is this thought true? And not to buy into it and not to take the bait of our own internal drama. So Nancy Morbach, who talks about these starter positions, for at least the 10 days. So we're looking at, you know, again, we've got the mindful preparation. So mom is in a better headspace. And then we have her starting with the, the starter positions for the first 10 days. Traditional breastfeeding is disempowering women and it's confusing women. I mean, when you look at any website, look for how to latch a baby on, it is mind numbing. It is complicated, it is confusing, lead with the chin, thick, no, you know, K, you know, the K lips, um don't hold baby's neck there's so many rules and then we know that memory can be compromised on day two so that's making the recall more difficult so mom is panicking because she's trying to get baby latched on and there's all of this other stuff happening with her body and she is not in a positive mental state and then information overload so all that teaching is not an oxytocin um facilitating uh, experience so we've made it overly complicated and we have and in the same breath told women that it's really natural so we've got babies born with these primitive neonatal reflexes and again here we are with you know suzanne colson's research is probably at least 20 years old maybe a little bit older still hasn't really been implemented we've started to see some new rcts on biological nurturing and laid back but it's again why did it take 20 years for us to realize we can literally stand back again if mom and baby are doing okay and let the let baby express these neonatal reflexes to assist with feeding so these pressure points on baby are triggered when baby's in full body contact so when we are are forcing women into these complicated upright positions and we have these now these pressure points that are now being and, and reflexes are being dysregulated because of gravity so if we lie back to a comfortable recline with baby on our chest below the chin so we can see baby and make eye contact with baby 
but upright positions it's more painful for mom she is i mean think of that this this laid back netflix position as being the default position for the first two weeks at home she doesn't have to mom does not have to worry about figuring out what baby's cues are um baby is right next door to the buffet so baby will feed frequently so there's going to be less panic about getting baby's weight up you know because in I, at least in the us you know babies have to go for their uh, their baby weight watchers to a pediatrician's office which is that's a whole other discussion so this is what what we're suggesting that this netflix position so mom is literally being taken care of hopefully with a midwife at home or a postpartum doula and a great partner um but that full body contact support of baby's feet but what we've seen in re very recent rcts is that women who are doing this position who are shown this in hospital and these studies were all done in hospital were significantly less likely to have nipple trauma nipple pain and they were more likely to uh, breastfeed past three months and in one of the studies it was to breastfeed past six months so we're building that confidence in the mind and the body but we can do it with hands off um as much as possible um but i think this is imagine this is the postpartum position or sidelining but we've now you know we have mom who is feeding her baby in this position and yes we're not saying she's going to go to starbucks and feed in this position but what she can do is once she has like her brain has come like back on online really give it 10 days or so where baby is feeding frequently right next to that to that buffet there's no issues with weight gain and we know then that okay now we're, we're 10 days in or just one moment you know and then we have a mom that now can do all the complicated positions and, and be out and about so but this is uh so that's my quick argument time to rethink breastfeeding preparation i think so